Hi, everybody. Welcome to Chatbox. I'm David Cruz. Lots on the plate today. We'll talk about some progress in Trenton on financial help for undocumented workers hit hard by COVID-19. And we'll talk to three icons of the progressive movement in New Jersey who picked the same year to retire. What's next for them and what's next for Trenton? But first, we need to talk about this news regarding the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. As if vaccine hesitancy wasn't bad enough, we get the news this week that the Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control recommended a halt to distribution of the J&J &J vaccine. This came after reports of six women developing rare but severe blood clots after receiving the one-dose vaccine. One of the women died and another one had to be hospitalized. So how much should you be concerned? Let's bring in our first guest. She is a Princeton grad with a medical degree from Duke University School of Medicine and an executive master of public health and health services management from Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. Now the chief strategic integration and health equity officer for University Hospital. It is a pleasure to welcome Chris Purnell to Chatbox. Doctor, good to meet you and welcome. Good to be here. So now we should point out that almost 7 million J&J &J doses have been administered. So the side effects come out to less than uh, one in a million, zero cases in New Jersey. But uh, let's tell people who appears to be affected and what the symptoms are. Definitely. So this is very important news. And first, I want to start with why this is this action is encouraging for me. It's encouraging because it shows that there are robust and adequate checks and balances built into the system. So what happened is that six women between the ages of 18 and 48 out of nearly 7 million Johnson & Johnson doses that had been administered nationally, developed a very rare form of blood clots. Those blood clots are known as cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. In addition to that rare blood clotting uh, disorder, uh, these patients also had thrombocytopenia. So they had uh, less platelets than you would normally have and platelets are used to help the blood clot. So those symptoms or that disorder was evidenced about six to 13 days after administration of the vaccine and those persons presented with a range of symptoms, whether it was severe headache in almost all of the cases, abdominal pain, leg pain, and shortness of breath. We hear about those as kind of side effects, the body soreness and the headache, but that's not this, right? People should, should kind of see that distinction. No, it's definitely not the same. So when we were educating the public around the likely side effects from either the Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we were talking about flu-like symptoms. So a person could have um, fever, a person could have chills, in addition to tiredness or fatigue or a headache or body aches. This is different. Um, you wouldn't necessarily see anyone presenting with infectious symptoms so or flu-like symptoms, so no fever or chills, but that severe headache, a person could even have stroke-like symptoms or altered consciousness in addition to that shortness of breath, leg pain or leg swelling and abdominal pain. So the CDC says they're gonna need another uh, week to, to look at the data what are they looking at and what are they looking for? It's going to be very important for the CDC and the FDA to be confident that the data is showing a direct link. When we look at adverse reactions that occur because of a vaccine or because of any intervention or therapeutic, you want to be able to answer, is this a correlation? Or is this a direct link, meaning is this directly caused by the vaccine itself? And so the CDC is taking what I believe is the proper time to fully evaluate what is known about the six women um, that this disorder occurred in and what we can know about what may have Pre precipitated uh, those symptoms when they first started. And what we know to date is that it was a very rare occurrence. Um, it only happened in women, women 18 to 48. I just want to reiterate that. And it happens anywhere from six days to 13 days after administration. So these J&J &J jabs, 
they were seen as a way to get the vaccine into communities of color and into rural areas, you know, one shot and then and done. But now this seems to play right into the narrative of those who are skeptical uh, about the vaccine. There's been a lot of, see, I told you so on social media. How do you combat that now, especially among communities of color who are still lagging behind the rest of the state in vaccinations, but still leading in negative outcomes? You know, we hold the line, um, and that's the simplest way that I can put it. What we actually were seeing is that in communities of color, those historically excluded communities, we were seeing something described as slow to yes. But we actually started to see a change in that. If you look at even national polling data that was done by the Kaiser Family Foundation, we were seeing a conversion of those who may have been slow to yes actually becoming willing or enthusiastic around receiving a vaccine dose. Outside of those issues related to um, hesitancy, we saw more issues related to access, meaning the time, the location, whether or not um, people had transportation to a vaccine site, issues around health literacy and language. So we're gonna have to continue to double down on those bedrock initiatives that we know work, continue to explain the science in plain spoken terms, continue to explain it in socially and culturally fluent or relevant terms, and use trusted and credible messengers. And those messengers are going to be more important than they ever were before, because we're going to have to help this, the public decipher what does it mean that the J&J &J vaccine has been paused, and why did that happen, and explain how that is actually evidence that the system is working effectively. I love that you refer to community immunity as opposed to herd immunity. Do we need to pay more attention to the language that we use? I, I just feel like grandma relates much easier to the concept of community immunity. You know, it's all of us, not some nondescript herd. Is that kind of in your mind when you talk to people? Definitely. Language matters. Uh, we know language matters when we're talking about issues related to um, equity or we're talking about issues related to cultural competence or we're talking about issues related to health literacy. It's not just important who carries the message, but it's also important how they carry the message, what the message includes and what networks that message is spread along. So I, I adopted community immunity from one of my colleagues and I thought, but that made more sense. That's more accessible. It's easier to understand. And it shows that we're all in this together. Do we have to kind of, um, we keep hearing that more young people are being affected. Does that affect the messaging and the way you get the message out to people? I think it does. When you know different subpopulations are uh, being affected in disparate ways or the trends are emerging in different racial and ethnic group or uh, across different age uh, distributions, you think about what's the best way to message those groups. Uh, younger folks are something that we refer to in public health as digital natives. Um, they have been raised and cultivated in a very virtual space. They understand social Social media. So we need to make sure we're using multimodal methods of communication and not only using multimodal methods of communication, whether that's Snapchat or whether that's uh, on Twitter or whether that's on Instagram, but that we're also using influencers that matter in those communities to say, hey, it's a priority for you to get safe and stay safe and then educate on what is meant by getting safe and staying safe practicing those bedrock public health uh, measures, wearing your mask all the time when you're outside of your household, frequent hand washing, being at least six feet apart from others and avoiding crowded and cramped indoor spaces. All right, words matter, platforms matter. Dr. Chris Purnell, good to meet you. Thanks for coming on with us. Thanks for having me. So there has been a year long campaign to draw attention to the struggle of undocumented workers who have lost their jobs because of COVID-19. Advocates have been organizing demonstrations and workers have been engaging in hunger strikes outside of the state house all week long. Uh, this week, it looked like finally the governor was hearing them. Politico reported that the administration was about to propose a $40 million uh, fund for one-time payments to the hardest hit. Joining us to talk about that is the director of 
Make the Road New Jersey, which advocates for the rights of immigrants, undocumented and otherwise. Sarah Cullinane, welcome back to Chatbot. Good to see you. Great to see you, David. Thanks for having me. So let's identify who we're talking about here. They're, these are people who've been working in everything from laundromats to construction to daycare to restaurants, right, in the country without required documents and therefore ineligible for unemployment or any kind of stimulus payments, right? That's right. There's a half a million undocumented immigrants in New Jersey who are now past a year uh, surviving without relief. And these are the folks that kept us safe during the pandemic. They delivered packages to our doorsteps. They create, they made meals. They stocked supermarket shelves. They are essential workers. And when they lost their jobs, um, they have been ineligible for unemployment, for pandemic unemployment, uh, for stimulus payments uh, for more than a year, surviving for more than a year without any type of relief. So you broke down what a uh, $40 million fund, which is something that was proposed this week uh, by the administration. You broke down what that 40 million would mean for those who are affected. What did you find? You know, it's we, we found that it's really just completely insufficient. The, um, to put this in context, um, more than a dozen states and municipalities have taken action to provide relief um, just last week, New York State passed a historic $2.1 billion fund for excluded workers, immigrant workers left behind, California, Oregon, Colorado, New Mexico. Um, all of these states have stepped up to provide aid. Um, and, you know, in New Jersey, we have a higher share of undocumented workers in our workforce than in New York and other states. We really, uh, undocumented workers are doing the crucial backbreaking and risky work to keep our state safe. Um, and so uh, the $40 million fund is, is just insufficient and needs to be more. Um, and, and we're urging the governor to increase that. I will also say the legislature has also had an opportunity to act and has failed to act. There was legislation with bipartisan support that was pending all of last year um, to provide relief and, um, and leadership failed to bring that for a vote. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're encouraged that Governor Murphy is taking active steps, that he's listening to the community, that he's listening to the 34 essential immigrant workers, mainly women, who've been fasting for now nine days. Um, and, and we're urging him to increase um, the fund and, and to really provide real relief that will uh, sustain these families, these workers, and make sure that our whole state can get on a pathway to recovery. So I saw a number of like $92 uh, per person uh, who would be eligible. Uh, but then I saw, I, I think it was from your organization, a proposal that suggested uh, a $2,000 one-time payment and $600 a week in unemployment type uh, payments. Is, is that about right? That's right. That's the demand of the hunger strikers. That's the demand of the coalition for recovery for all. We need real relief. It's been a whole year. While the rest of the country has received $3,200 in stimulus payments, unemployment and pandemic unemployment, undocumented immigrants are um, really surviving on fumes. And it's it's time for real relief, um, not, not crumbs, not um, not a pittance. We need real funds to um, to support and sustain these families. I want to play for you a clip from uh, the presumptive Republican uh, nominee for governor when we asked him about this very thing. Let's listen and we'll come back. David, the last thing that legal citizens who are waiting month upon month upon month for their unemployment benefits want to hear is that tax dollars, whether state or federal, are being used for illegal immigrants. So let's take care of those that follow the rules first uh, before we start looking to other populations. So I know that's not the first time you've heard that, but you mentioned that bill that was in the legislature uh, that was put forth by Teresa Ruiz, who said, I think it was $35 million. She said she proposed that it was almost a year ago as a way to start the conversation. But as you suggested, no profiles encouraged from the legislature here. They're all up for re-election and, and seem unwilling to, to uh, support a bill like that right now. That's right. And I think, you know, 
we have seen that undocumented immigrants are paying into the system. They're paying 600 million in state and local taxes, a billion dollars into the unemployment system coming out of their paychecks over the past 10 years. Those are the funds that are sustaining our unemployment system here in New Jersey. And so to tell someone um, that they shouldn't qualify for aid, that that they shouldn't be eligible for relief during a pandemic when they've paid into the system, when they've been part of this community, when they've been doing the work to protect so many other residents um, is just, um, it's unfathomable. And, um, and, and we're really looking for courage and leadership to, to stand up and provide real relief. So but I guess you do take heart a little bit in the sense that the governor did at least propose something, but in your mind, he's still far away from where he needs to be. It's an incredibly important first step and we, we really need to make sure that we can have real relief um, for, for so many families who've been left behind from relief. All right, Sarah Cullinane, Make the Road, New Jersey. Always good to see you. Keep it up. Thanks for taking a few minutes with us. Thank you, David. Great to see you. Finally tonight, the Trinity of Terra the troika of trouble, the three-legged stool of social justice. <laughs> After more than 30 years in elected office, serving on the local, county, and state level, Senator Loretta Weinberg announced that she will be seek, will not be seeking re-election this year and will retire when her term ends in January. Welcome, Senator. Thank you After, very much. I like that. The trinity of trouble. <laughs> yeah. After 40 years on the job, Hetty Rosenstein is retiring as state director with the Communications Workers of America. And Jeff Tittle, the man who coined the term Viagra Falls and many other groaners, <laughs> announced his retirement after 23 years at the, uh, at the New Jersey chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, panel, welcome to you all. Thank you. So, we did. Thank you. We couldn't so, ask for a better introduction. Yeah, really. <laughs> but but it's so I'm good curious trouble. if you could just briefly explain how you ended up doing what you did for these decades. How did it start for you, Senator? Uh, well, you know, I tell people I came of age in the 60s. Uh, we had moved to uh, Teaneck, settled down with my husband, two small babies and a dog. And there was the anti-Vietnam War movement, the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, the school integration issue. So I uh, barely unpacked my dishes, went down to the local headquarters to volunteer to make the world a better place, I thought, uh, for my little ones. Hetty, were you always going to be a union organizer? Did you come from a union family? I did come from a union family, I, and I came from an activist family it, it, from the womb. But I was a teacher at the New Jersey Job Corps, and we didn't have enough. Our working conditions were so bad that we couldn't teach. And so my sister was organizing a union in New York. And so I thought, well, we'll do that. We'll organize a union so that we can do our jobs. And at what, that what point, I didn't this? even know CWA was there. What year was that? That's 1979. 1979, uh, Tittle, I end up with CWA in 81, yeah. Jeff Tittle, you've always been a troublemaker, I imagine. I came from a family of activists. My grandparents, uh, my parents were always very much involved. I did my first sit-in when I was four years old on, uh, at Woolworths uh, during the civil rights movement. And my family helped start the first interracial camp in New Jersey, Camp Midvale, which is now called the uh, Nature, New Nature Friends Camp of White Psychology. Um, it was the first interracial camp. You had to be a trade unionist and an environmentalist. Growing up in Hillside, you know, in, in Newark on the border, you know, we had founders in the area. You could write your name on the cars. You could throw matches on streams right. and they flare up. I go up to Ringwood in the water. You could drink out of the stream. So I had that progressive ethic and a activist ethic from since I was born and an environmental ethic as well. You know, and most David, people, my they... family went to that camp. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you? Yes, yeah. my family you, went you to that into one another, though. And I remember it. Mm -hmm. 
still there. You know, most you back. people who come on to the Zoom uh, uh, type calls, they usually go in front of family pictures or in, in front of uh, impressive bookcases with important titles. Jeff Tittle shows up in front of his bar. <laughs> so, I noted that. <laughs> so what was the biggest difference in Trenton when you all got to Trenton? Let's start with you, Hetty. Uh, when did you get to Trenton and, and how different was it then than it is today, if at all? Oh yeah, it was very different. Well, I was a lot younger <laughs> and much more idealistic and hadn't seen all that sausage making at the time. But here's what I will say, the legislators acted more on their own. Now the leadership really, it feels like controls everything. There were a lot more um, legislators who would sort of speak out. That's how I remember it. And a lot more mavericks at the time. Jeff? Yeah, I first started going to Trenton when I was in college driving Alex Menza, who was a progressive state senator from Hillside where I grew up. And you, and you really had people who were dedicated to changing the laws and moving things forward and even standing up you know, to their own party. And when I started getting active more on my own in the environment later, you know, I walked in, I had a meeting with Helen Fenske and she said, whatever you need, you're getting active in Ringwood. We need someone to get active up there in the Highlands. And so, you know, you, you felt that government responded and that the legislature responded. Today, things seem to be more on autopilot and there's just too many bobbleheads. Well, I, I, I was going to go to Senator, uh, <laughs> but I didn't want to go after you called them all bobbleheads. But Not, no, I would never Senator say that about Loretta. <laughs> And now we're right. I, can right. Stand, I could retire President because two of the women I respected President. the most in Trenton got to retire before me. Thank you very the, uh, much. President was Company the Senate excluded. much more full of independence, Senator? Well, when I came into the Senate 25 some odd years ago, it was completely dominated by Republicans. So, yes, it was very different for me. When I came into the assembly, there were 22 of us. 22 Democrats out of the 80 members, and only one other woman in our caucus who soon left to go into the uh, tail end of the uh, Florio administration. So we were a uh, ineffective minority to say the least, uh, but it was a great learning process. Um, I am interested in what, uh, you know, I. I probably agree with what Hetty said, um, more leadership dominated in terms of the agenda and what gets posted and committee assignments and so on. But there is still plenty of room in both houses of the legislature for those legislators who choose to be passionate about an issue, about moving legislation forward for an issue about engaging advocates and grassroots support. So I think there's plenty of leeway and plenty of room for that kind of um, individual action. We, we have a viewer uh, question, uh, I'll paraphrase. Uh, Hedy, you kind of touched on this. Um, you said you were much more idealistic uh, in the earlier days. Um, I, I guess I'll ask uh, you, Senator and Jeff, if some of that idealism has has gone away and how do you try and keep some kind of idealism going? Let's start with you, Jeff, and then we'll get the Senator. Well, I've always been sort of a cynical idealist where I know things are stacked, but if you work hard, you mobilize the public, you can win. And that's been the history of New Jersey from stopping off offshore dumping to protecting the highlands and one thing after another. So yes, there is a little cynicism, but I've always been an idealist. And I think you wouldn't do this if you didn't have the hope that you're going to make things better. Senator, you're a bit I of a wisecracker, but are you a, are you a cynic? No, I describe myself much more as maybe a, real, a realistic optimist. If I wasn't optimistic and an idealist, then I don't think I could have stayed in this as long as I have. I have the optimism to believe that we can really change things and a passionate belief, which sometimes I wish I could get over, 
<laughs> so that I didn't feel so passionate about issues. But um, along with Hetty, and I know that though she might have become more cynical or realistic, however one wants to describe it over the years, we both share, sometimes from opposite sides of a given issue, we both share that passion along with Jeff. I think that's the one word that would describe the three of this trio of trouble as you introduced us. Hedy, you have had to broker some deals. Uh, have you been able to maintain any kind of idealism through this? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, you can't fight for justice for <laughs> decades if you don't really believe in it. And here's the other piece of it. If you have deep convictions, you have the courage of them. And if you have the courage of them, then you have some optimism. Um, and I will say on the other side of what I said, there are more coalitions active now than there were 25 years ago. I mean, I was a founding member of New Jersey Citizen Action. We were the only game in town at that point. And now there are dozens of progressive organizations. There's Make the Road and unbelievable leaders like Sarah and, um, you know, an, an incredibly vibrant immigrant rights movement in this state. Um, you know, there's a huge fight over racial justice going on in this state. That was not the case um, at that point in time. And there was some, but there is activism and deep organization. So yeah, I'm hopeful. I'm not not hopeful um, in spite of seeing a lot of sausage making. No, I'm, I'm hopeful have, and, uh... and, and I'm still in this fight, I feel. I have another viewer question uh, asking, what is your proudest moment, your, uh, the accomplishment of which you're most proud? Let's start with you, Jeff. I think getting the Highlands Act passed. Um, you know, it, and as Loretta knows, there was a lot, of, a lot going on, but I think that to me, trying to protect the drinking water for six and a half million people to build a land mm -hmm. use model to pr protect that area with all the backlash from builders and you know realtors and everyone else i, I think that was a major accomplishment of the mine and i know it's in loretta i know was part of it but i think to me that stands out senator i'm not going to ask you to list all of your uh, legislative accomplishments if you could put the, them all together and kind of define what the thing that you're most proud of uh, about yourself about your legacy well, I think it's easier to say what I'm most proud of about a whole series of pieces of legislation that really affected people's lives. What Jeff talked about really affects people's lives. So I have a series of legislation uh, requiring 48 hours for new moms and their babies in the hospital, banning indoor smoking, um, marriage equality, reproductive rights for women, a whole litany. What it all comes down to is a fight for the people I know best, for the women who are raising children, taking care of the frail elderly mother, the young married couple struggling here to try to get a little piece of uh, real estate to call home, all of the things that I've shared with so many other residents of the state of New Jersey. It's what spurred me here, what kept me here, and what I really know best. Hetty, how about you? I mean, you've organized. You, uh... Go ahead. Organizing thousands of workers into unions, whether it was the state uh, organizing drive, which is 40 years old in on May 29th, uh, the largest organizing drive in this country that had happened in 50 years, 7,000 home child care workers, public defenders, thousands and thousands of low wage workers becoming union members. I'd say that is the first and the second is, of course, the first full pension payment in 25 years 
And I hope that I contributed to the fight to get that payment. All right, I'm running you know, out of time here, so I'm going uh, well, to merge. Let, let me just add, it. it's a privilege to be here with these other two giants. And I look forward to the three of us getting together when our retirement takes place, planning our own revolutions. With some <laughs> of the alcohol. Some of Jeff drinks in, in Jeff Tittle's bar. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> uh, I got plenty of wine, too. <laughs> so I'm running out of time, so I'm kind of I'm going to kind of merge these two questions. Uh, who was your favorite governor to work with and or against? And give me a, a letter grade for the current governor. I know Chris Christie once famously suggested that someone take a bat to you, Senator. Is he oh, your yes. favorite men uh, nemesis? Yes. I said Chris Christie was my favorite governor to work with and against. Uh, I have a whole collection of baseball bats and orange traffic cones. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Chris Christie. Uh, he was an interesting adversary and he was wrong on so many issues, continues to be wrong on many of those issues. And uh, it has been quite refreshing for me to have Governor Murphy there with his signing pen. Because if one collected veto pens, I would be the winner of that contest. <laughs> what, would, what letter grade would you give to uh, the current governor? Is that for me? Yes. Yeah, I, I would actually give the current governor a B plus, which is pretty All right, good Jeff Tittle, who for was four years. My favorite governor Jeff to Tittle, work who with was, was your, the, your favorite governor to work with and or against? Well, my favorite one to work with was Jim McGreevy because he liked policy. And though sometimes he called me up six in the morning with some environmental idea that he wanted to work on. But I think we got a lot done under him with the clean car bill and uh, the Highlands and C1 streams and their first renewable portfolio standard. Chris Christie was my favorite to work against because we would, you know, like one time I didn't go to one of his press conferences on the environment and he had me they called me up to say, weren't you there? He wanted to have a fight with you. Um, so I think it was him. <laughs> so, you know, in that respect, because we had that, you know, back and forth a lot. Um, he, you know, he'd make fun of me. I'd make fun of him a little bit. So it was kind of fun to banter. Um, Governor McGreevy, excuse me, Governor um, uh, Murphy, Murphy has come forward with a lot of uh, ideas and programs, but a lot of them have not gone in place yet. And so even though I'd like to give him like a B plus or an A on, on what he, he said, it's really closer to an average because we, you know, it may get done in the second term, but right now, you know, we still have a lot of Christie rules in place. We still have a lot of Christie people on Highlands and Pinelands and there's some good things he wants to do on, on you know, green energy, but we got to get it built. So I think, you know, where he wants to go is a B plus where he is, is somewhere a little lower than that. All right. Let's call it a C. Hetty? Oh, well, you know, Chris Christie gets, uh, the, you know, the number one from all it's of us. Animus. He was an amazing rival, that is for sure, and did a lot of damage. So there's no question I put him there. I really like Phil Murphy. He's the most pro-union governor we've I've ever had. I've lived through 10 of them, and I've negotiated with 10 of them. And he really fundamentally believes in collective bargaining. I think mean, he's done an incredible job under unbelievably difficult circumstances. I also really liked Jim McGreevy. It's impossible not to really like Jim McGreevy. Mm -hmm. But I give um, Governor Murphy an A. All right, fair enough. Hetty Rosenstein, Loretta Weinberg, Jeff Tittle, great to see all of you again. Don't be a stranger, as they say. And thanks to all of you for all your good work. Thank you. That's chat box for this week. Thanks to our guests, Chris Purnell, Sarah Cullinane, Hetty Rosenstein, Loretta Weinberg, and Jeff Tittle. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz NJ, and be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel to get more chat box, plus other great content like Reporters Roundtable, NJ Business Beat, and NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. I'm David Cruz for all the crew over here. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.
Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. The Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey, the National Oil Heat Research Alliance and BioHeat, the evolution of oil heat. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight. Online at insidernj.com.